Muriel Bamblett, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me this morning for our Family Violence Leadership Alumni Newsletter. You've been an inspiration for me in my leadership journey. And I don't know if I've told you this, um, Muriel, but when I went to Cambodia, you came with me. You were sitting on my shoulder advising me about how to work cross-culturally the whole way through. So I really want to acknowledge and thank you for the leadership um, that you've demonstrated across the child and family welfare sector. You've been the CEO at VACA for over 20, 20, years, 20 years now. You've been the chair of SNAKE. You've been um, acknowledged for your leadership in the sector in more ways than I'm going to be able to go through now. But in Order of Australia, you're on the honour roll in Victoria. You're on the Aboriginal honour roll um, inducted into that um, more recently. You've been awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws um, and Social Work um, from La Trobe and honorary Laws from Sydney University. So you've been acknowledged for the leadership you've shown, shown in the sector um, by many people. So... Um, I my my first question is um, leading out of a conversation that you and I have had a number of times about your mother mm. and what you've learnt about leadership from your mother and the strong women in your family. Yeah, look, um, thank you very much for having. Um, as is always um, my tradition, I just want to acknowledge all the lands um, that we are. On today and acknowledge elders and past and present and emerging. Um, my people are Yorta Yorta and Jajarong and Bunarong and Tongarong. And so I'm probably one of the very fortunate ones in Victoria that has, you know, really still kept strong links. But, you know, in, in talking to, um, you know, about today, about the person that kept those strong links, and it was my mum. And I think my mum had to overcome some huge, really big issues, both by dad and mum. Um, my dad was born on Lake Tyre's mission. He was put off the mission when he was 14 because he had fair skin. He was the oldest of 13 children. And my grandmother um, really, really struggled when my dad was put off the mission because he was the one that took on the parenting role because most of the men had to leave the mission to work. And so my, it was heartbreaking for my dad but also for my mum. I can't imagine. I've got 14-year-old grandkids and I can't imagine what it would be no. like for them to be able to, to be told, go make your way in the world. So, But um, it, it, I was looking at a story about my mum and it's in a, in a book called Aboriginal Elders' Voices and um, I just want to sort of just share with you some of the um, some of the subheadings because, you know, in the book it talks about it's got all my generations of all my family so it's got my great great grandmother Louisa Briggs her daughter and my grandfather Henry Charles and then here is my grandmother Muriel Charles I never got to meet her she died when she was 22 in childbirth with my um another sibling with her fourth child so she was 22 but and so that set my mum on a journey because um my grandmother had died my great-grandmother actually um, took custody of my mum. And so it talks about growing, my mum talks about her story of growing up on the running from the, the um, welfare. She talks about living with Gran on the move because um, Granny, in order to keep my mum safe, had to keep one step ahead of the welfare and took jobs doing whatever, cooking for, for people on sheep stations. And she actually had to leave her husband and her family behind. And then she talks about running from the, again from the welfare. Um, she then talks about settling home on Kamla Gunjan. And so she actually um, lived for a period. And my mum talks about fishing and sitting on the um, banks of the um, river and, and having talks with my grandmother. And, and I just yearn for those moments. And yeah. so, um, and then talks about the Kamla Gunjan mission. But she also talked about um, one night when she was, she, um, I was talking, reminiscing on Kamra Gunja and she said, Kamra Gunja, that was where my family was from. That was my home. And she talked about the time. I looked up at the sky and I said, my land, my land. This is mine. This is mine. This is my grand ground. This is my place. This is my country. They can't take this away. So for me, and then my mum also talks about the um, camera gun to walk off because she was part of that and what, how tough it really uh -huh. talks about how tough it was, people, and acknowledges those people. And my mum was always great at acknowledging people that 
um, stood up for us, and I think that that's really important. But then she talks about living out of Barmer Forest and how hard that was. And she met my dad on Hill 60. I thought it was a big hill, but it was a little mound, and so that's where their camp was and where she met my dad. And so it, it, it sort of talks about, but she talks about schooling and the importance of education. And one of the things that my mum was really strong with us about was education. She always um, pushed us to get an education. Every morning I was the last out of bed and she always pushed me out the door. And she had this great focus on education. And so I think um, everybody needs to have somebody in their life that cares about them and loves them as much. And, you know, there are many stories that I can tell about my mum. I know I went to the doctor once and he said to me, you've got the best formed um insides, internal, every internal organised uh, organ is perfectly formed. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, your mother must have taken really good care of you when she was, when you were in her stomach. She must have really, um, you know, provided with you the best food and the best nurturing because everything is perfectly formed. And I thought, what a gift, you know, yeah. the gift that keeps giving every time I think of, you know, I've got over losing my mum, um, you know, something else happens. So I think, you know, you, you have to be able to hold on to those special things. And So she taught me many lessons. I had stand-up fights with her, um, but, you know, like we never won. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think back on those and I think they just make you strong. And I'm very blessed to come from very strong. I had a grandmother that was three foot that was a, ruled us and you know like ruled us not with nastiness or violence or anything like that but with you know Aboriginal law and so yeah. you know we went tomato picking with my grandmother once and we were out um we we were allowed to, to pick tomatoes and then for a period of time we could go run wild which we always did anyway so there were nine in my family and when we finished the day we'd go and Nan would say to us you kids, make sure you're back in the camps before the shadows of the sun go into the ground because when you see the shadows of the tree go into the ground, that's when the Dulagars come out. And so the Dulagars were the scariest hairy men that you could think of and so we were terrified and so guess where we were by the time the shadows of the tree had hit the ground? We we didn't have watches, so, you know, and elders taught us so, and so many stories and they're in... You know, they permeate all that into your life. Your, you know what I can hear when you talk like that, Muriel, is the love and care that I see you demonstrating for the children and families that VACA works with and how much your heart, that's what I hear when you tell those stories, is, is that love that I have seen from you for the people that, that are in your care, you know, like what the way you talk about your grandmother looking after you and your mother's love and, and passion for education, that's that's what I see you transmitting for the next generation. And you have absolutely um, been prepared to put yourself on the line for that. Yeah, I think um, I think Aboriginal people fight every day and I think, you know, like we, we do it out of love for our community, but I think, you know, um, what, what I you know, see with stolen chains, what I see with children that are in the child protection system, it, it is about, you know, inequality, inequity, um, inability to understand what it is that, that there's a service system out there that's for everybody, not just for the people that are rich or the people that know about the services. And so it does worry me that our people don't think they have a right to services and supports and that they don't feel that, you know, or they feel that they'll be judged by a service. And so there's been so many learnings that, that I, you know, I've learned it back on. But the, the worst one is, I think, um, and the most challenging was when I started back, it was around um, the absence of culture in our work. And so we were, you know, doing mm. child welfare, but we were doing it like everybody else. And we weren't making a difference. And we had kids, you know, were really struggling and then we really identified that the thing that they were really most hungry for was the cultural base. Most of these kids didn't know who they were, didn't know where they'd come from, had no experience of Aboriginal culture and, you know, like we would do our NAIDOC activities and we'd bring kids in once a year and that was it and then, you know, yeah. Christmas time we'd have 
you know, Aboriginal Christmas and we'd do that. But then we found out that we would just, you know, we, we needed to do more. So in child welfare now we're doing cultural support planning, we're doing return to country, we're doing lots of camps, camps for kids on culture. And so developing lots of resources and materials and we've set up the deadly uh, the deadly portal so kids mm. can go into that and learn about their Aboriginal culture and know where they come from. But, you know, some of the most exciting things are about seeing the changes in children and young people when they go on and put their feet on their own country and they've learnt the history of their people yeah. and what their people have contributed. And I think yeah. they're the most, for me, the proudest moments working with BAPA is seeing Aboriginal kids walk away. I think the hardest case for me was when an 18-year-old left our care and then came come to, come came knocking on the door and start, said, can you um, do a reunion with my father because we, we run the link-up program for stolen gems? Mm-hmm. He wanted to meet his Aboriginal father. Now, mm-hmm. why couldn't we do that? All those years he was in child protection. Why did yeah. no one think it was important that he should know his Aboriginal father? So I think, you know, um, those are the things that leave an indelible mark on your mind. Yeah, they do, and you and you've led some of the transformation of of a whole range of the mainstream services as well around what it is that they need to do, and and calling them to account um, about how they care for Aboriginal children and families. When you, I, I'm curious. So I'm leaving the script a bit in terms of the questions we talked about, Muriel. But what you've talked about about bringing culture to service delivery, if you think about bringing culture to family violence services. What is it that what is it that you've learnt about how to do that well? Look, I think um, in the family violence space, we've had you know st- strategies within Victoria, and so we've had various ten year strat. We've just come off one ten year strategy. Mm-hmm. We've just started the new Jalcha strategy, and I think Aboriginal people for a long time have known what we what, what can work and what what we need to do. There's been just a real lack of real systemic approach and institutional, and so they tend to, you know, it's tended to be drip fed around. Oh, we'll give you some funding, and you can, you know, do a march, or you can do t-shirts. And but you know, what we've seen is a real change institutionally and systemically now. There's a better engagement and understanding that Aboriginal people not only need to be recipients of the service systems, or you know, have. have you know, professionals on one side of the table and not see Aboriginals as professionals. And so we have now Aboriginal people working at the Orange Doors. We have Aboriginal people that are working with across the whole service system. And since that's happened, we have Aboriginal people now working with the police around response. We have Aboriginal people um, in the courts looking at family violence and, and looking at, you know, informing magistrates mm-hmm. about family violence. So we see now a lot of the uh, Aboriginal people are much more comfortable in the system. What, what's interesting is the concern we have is the high levels of Aboriginal women that are having violence perpetrated by non-Aboriginal men. And so 85% of um, Aboriginal women presenting tobacco, um, the violence is perpetrated by a non-Aboriginal man. And so some of our thinking is, is that what is the view of non-Aboriginal men, of women that they particularly about women, that they can think of them as less than. And so do we need to do work with women rather than only just do work with men as perpetrators? And so how do we work with women around behaviour change, about thinking, I deserve better than this, I don't deserve it. And and sometimes when you come from a history of violence and and neglect and abuse, sometimes there's an expectation that, that that is a form of, you know, um, love. And, and I think we've got to rethink our Aboriginal community around what are the concepts of family violence. But we do, you know, and we're not saying that we're not innocent in, in this. And, I mean, a, the impact of violence on children is significant. We know that 70, at the moment 72% of children come into care because of family violence. And so we know that... Um, we need to do some work around what that looks like. And so a lot of our leadership is around how do we actually understand uh, the triggers for violence? How do we actually work around intervention? How do we work with both men, women and children around trauma responses and healing and treatment, not just saying, yeah. you know, we, we're going to, you've got to, you know, make change your behaviour. And often, you know, it relates to addressing drug and alcohol issues 
addressing homelessness, housing, joblessness, all those sort of things are, are really, and so taking up all of um, whole of family approach to family violence. I think it, we've seen leadership by men and standing up. Aboriginal men, a lot of Aboriginal men now are making statements and saying that it's not on. Um, and I think that that's really been significant in the Aboriginal community. I think um, a couple of men have done it and felt really uncomfortable afterwards because a lot of people sort of, you know, that they, they felt that they, you know, a bit uncomfortable, but not, not in themselves for doing it, but, you know, in, uncomfortable because of the way it was reacted to by the community. So I think that we now see, I think a lot more women are getting a better sense of what it is that they can do about family violence. And I think that's what we want. I think the whole community wants. But we've got grandmothers standing up. We've got young women. We've got elders, I think. And we've got men. We've got young men. We're getting programs and services. And we're actually taking it up to government about what we can change. And Muriel, you've talked about the need for change in culture and change in your people in your community. But but what we're seeing is a recognition with the Black Lives Matters, you know, the level of grief and outrage and anger that's been pouring out from people after the death of George Floyd. But but how much it's resonated with what's happening here in Australia and the impact of that. A whole lot of particularly young people I've talked to have talked about understanding now about the level of racism that Aboriginal experience um, in a way that they never did before. And one of the quotes that really st has stood out for me in one of the articles that I read um, was about, um, yes, yes, COVID is terrible, but my life has been a pandemic of racism. Mm. Um, what what's your kind of what what's your reflections on what it is that we can learn at this moment, you know, and in terms of change and the impact that it's having on 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 your community? Look, I think really important. Um, this is not to walk away and and let it, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter um, just be a campaign and we march in the street and then. Tomorrow we'll get on with COVID, and, you know, and we'll forget. Mm. So I think that the fact that there are still um, vigils being held in in Australia and, and activities still proposed, and so I think it goes to the fact that we we you know definitely want to see action. And I think that there are different ways that people are thinking about it, and how do we actually think about you know um, what is the role of the media, what is the role of mm. society, and, and do we take it up? You know, how do we get government to actually recognise this? But how do we get broader society? Uh, it's very much on people. It's raised the level, but it's opportune time to say, well, what are we going to do about it? Because yes. I, I think that um, people are sort of looking for, well, who's going to lead us out of this? Yes. You know, where, where's, it, where's the leadership going to come in Australia from? Clearly, I mean, what's concerning is the Prime Minister doesn't think we have a problem, so... That, that's a bit concerning because if you can't own it, what we need to do is own it. And if you look at, we've lost 432 lives since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal mm. Death and Custody was held, and they made 259 recommendations. And um, as I heard someone speak about today, it's about if you thought about um, those recommendations, if you thought about all of the inquiries, we yes. whole, Aboriginal people have been sat through inquiry after inquiry. We had so many hopes that you know, White Australia would change the way it thought about its policy towards Aboriginal people, that the system would change. And it seems to me that, you know, you get really good people that are really focused and then all of a sudden they move on to something else. And so we get, um, obviously, a lot of those things fall out. But if you think about the Uluru Statement from the Heart and, and many of the, what was, you know, what Aboriginal people poured into that was, I believe that combined with looking at the recommendation from the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths and Cuts, because they also included institutional abuse, racism, just yes. systemic racism, and they looked at a lot of areas that needed to be addressed in, in order to, you know, address the, um, the issue of, uh, you know, Aboriginal people deaths in custody. But I think um, what was striking from, I, I guess, the George Floyd case was the striking similarity with one particular case here in Australia 
where a young man was held down and he kept saying, I can't breathe and I can't breathe. Yes. And that, you know, cases, you know, nobody was charged, you know, and it was so similar. And what is it about our system that can't charge somebody for doing something wrong to an Aboriginal person? Why is it? Is it a system that's so skewed? It's so skewed towards the white people of Australia rather than to any, to the right, you know, doing the right thing and the just thing. And so I think in going forward, I think we would want to know that we can address race, racial equity, race, and, and address systemic e e equity and, and look at how do we address institutional and, and all of the, the elements of racism because racism it isn't people's, when you say racism, everybody thinks, oh, it's hate, it's based on hate. Racism is based on hate. It's, it's not. It's not as clear cut as that. It's not always just based on. Because when I say racism, immediate people get cringe and sort of think, "I'm not racist. I'm not racist." But um, it it it, fail, it fails to pick up the privileges that you have as a white person, and so fails to understand how emotionally how how you interact with the world so differently um, when. When you're not, when you don't have to think about your colour or think about you know anything to do, and and I think that until we can move away from racism not being about hate, it's just about what racism you know privileges you and how that you know sets you up to a different way of life and and to you know the, the privileges that that gives you. And I think that um, there's certainly some of the things that I think that we need to think think of going forward. And I think thinking about the audience that we're talking to, the family violence leaders and what it is that they need to be thinking about, about, about what we each need to confront about our own racism. Um, because you're right, there are moments that throughout my life I've kind of suddenly realised the biases that you grow up with um, mm. and being able to own and acknowledge um, and, and think those through and how they impact on your leadership and the decisions that you make and the way you operate is, is a fundamental task for all leaders. Um, and clearly something that in Australia we have an awful lot more work to do on. Yeah, and I think I, I think you raised that point. I think it's you view the world through your culture and through um, a whole different prism of what Aboriginal people would see it. And so I live eat, drink, sleep, Aboriginal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and But I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I live in a very multicultural Australia. And so, um, you know, like, and, and but to see at the Black Lives Matter march, it wasn't only Aboriginal people that were marching. There were Sud Sudanese, there were yes. so New Zealand, Maoris, there was, um, and you could see that people, you know, really do struggle with the element of being different in Australia. And so yeah. it is about how do we think about it. And I think Victoria is a lot better than other states. I lived in Queensland for a period of time. The level of racism that I saw up there was quite horrific. And, you know, particularly where you have a policy framework and a government framework and that, that works against Aboriginal people. And so... It, it was it was a constant. You, you just couldn't see. You felt like beating your head against the wall. And so, um, you know, and, and I think that when you have um, ministers and governments that get it, I remember um, Jenny McCarthy when she started as Minister for Children, she had a real commitment to Aboriginal and, and it took people yes. a long time to get yes. used to her prioritising and preferencing Aboriginal. And at, at times it be I felt a little bit uncomfortable in the room because, you know, she, most of her speeches were about Aboriginal and, and you would look around the room and you could sort of think, oh, um, I wonder if everybody's as comfortable with, you know, I felt very happy that but you, you do sort of, you know, she she did have a great focus and she changed the world for us. She really did. She, you know, her investment in family violence, her investment in, yeah. you know, so many areas she challenged. And the department, the department was prepared to put, you know, things on the line, guardianship, you know, we've now got yes. guardianship of hundreds of children, not people thought we wouldn't get past 10. And now, you know, the results are outstanding. 
And so Aboriginal people can leave, and that's what I think in the family violence system, it is about not being complacent about just accepting the status quo. How do we challenge the system to be able to change it? What can Aboriginal people do? deliver on what can they do better what can how can we change it not it and we know that if you gave the same bucket of money to Aboriginal organisations that goes out for family violence would they do it exactly the same way no probably not I'd probably think about different ways of doing it Muriel just didn't because I know you've got to go and we've got to finish up but the um one of the things that was reflected back to me in in looking at the orange doors was how much better how much we have to learn from Aboriginal controlled organisations um, about integrated practice. And mm. you, you raised it before. Family violence is about homelessness, education, health. It's, you know, so it's much, more, it's much more core to the way you think, lead, operate, is that people's lives are integrated already mm. it's the service system that is an integrated you know and how do we do better at that so you're already demonstrating and providing models for how things can be done better yeah look and I think that's been um core to the work I've been as been at back of there for 20 years when I first started the language was domestic violence, domestic violence and I remember going to numerous um forums on family violence and they can't call it Domestic violence, it's family violence because you can't say that the man just, you know, does this to the woman because, you know, it happens to the kids and we're all involved. I'm the, I get involved as the mother, I get involved as the auntie, I, the grandparents, we're all involved in this. Understand that it impacts on everybody. And so it, it, it's done it and then, you know, we, we really sort of evolved it. And I think part of the struggle that we had, it, it was always, you know, aligned to the feminist and, and that we had to have a feminist view about, um, you know, protecting women. And, and that often went, uh, in, in Australia, there's, you know, a, a lot of, it, it's aligned to the feminist thinking, but Aboriginal women don't see ourselves as leaving our men behind and the men, you know, we want to hold our men accountable. And so it's not about saying we don't want to protect ourselves, but we don't want that men don't have, that we don't have an approach that doesn't include men. Men have to be, we have to hold our men. And we're the women, we're the bosses, you know. Men will listen to us. Um, Anybody who doesn't know that you're the boss, Muriel, <laughs> hasn't spent much time with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is that women have the influence to change and the yes. capacity to change, more capacity to change the way, the outcomes of what's happening with with yeah. men. But we do need our men as well with us. We, it's not a you know men over women or women over men. It's, it's equitable in Aboriginal communities, and I think people often and we we get perplexed when people say, well, it's a feminist issue, and you only have to think about you know um, the women at the we can't think, I mean, and particularly, you know, in child welfare, how do you work around family violence and work with, without addressing? Women will often make the choice to stay with the man. Yes. Well, yes. If we well. can't, if we cannot do the work with that man, we cannot then get her to understand he's not going to change, then, you know, we we do need to be able to work with both of them. Yeah. And, and Muriel, that's not a contradiction for me in terms of what feminist leadership is about. It's about, about, about women being held equal, about Aboriginal people being held equal and working with the whole community. And, and men, men are central to that. Men are central to how are we going to, because you're right, my first experience working in family violence was as a young 23-year-old, I think, being surprised to realise just how women would make choices to go back um, and they would choose choose their men and their children over their own safety. Feminist well, leadership that, has to be about yeah. bringing everyone to, along. But most Aboriginal people would say the reason that we have so much violence from our men is because their role, their role they've been subjected to, they don't have jobs, they don't have status often the same status of how Aboriginal men were leaders, they were hunters, they were gatherers, they were, you know, they held a special status in Aboriginal family way of life. You take that away and all of a sudden, um, you know, women are still, you know, they're still 
the main players in the house. They still the bosses still running the house and still very strong in, in matriarchal ways. But patriarchal has, you know, had to evolve and change to a different way. And now Aboriginal men, many men have transitioned to a different way. But how do you take a very hunter-gatherer style and change it into a Western construct of working as a CEO or doing things down yeah. there? And I think it's, that's been the challenge. And I think, and history has put our men down quite and held our men back more than they've held back women. Mm. I think patriarchy is not good for a lot of men as much as it is not good for most women. So, mm. yeah. Muriel, thank you so much for your time. It's a really interesting conversation and I could keep going, but I know <laughs> we, need, we need to finish up. So let's continue it at some other point. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.